Welcome to Just Asia, HRC TV's weekly human rights program. These are the headlines. International Women's Day. Women's rights in Indonesia, 17 years after Suharto. Changes in mindset needed to improve women's rights in Pakistan. A new law in Bangladesh allowing girls to be married off before 18. A Kerala priest arrested for rape. A Shia community in Indonesia forcibly relocated. And urgent appeals from Sri Lanka, Indonesia and Pakistan. Welcome to HIC TV's Just Asia. I'm Jessica Fernando. This week, Just Asia begins with International Women's Day, which is annually celebrated on March 8th. The theme for 2017 is Women in the Changing World of Work, Planet 5050 by 2030. The idea is to work towards the 2030 agenda, which includes ending discrimination and violence against girls and women and ensuring free quality education for all children and promoting lifelong learning. Countries in Asia vary greatly in terms of women's education, political and economic empowerment, and access to health care. According to the 2016 Global Gender Gap Report, while the Philippines ranks first in Asia and seventh in the world, Malaysia ranks 106th and Pakistan ranks 143rd out of 144 countries. Throughout most of Asia, there is a lack of effective policies addressing entrenched prejudice and discrimination. Bangladesh has the highest rate of child marriage, while Pakistan has the highest rate of violence against women. Access to health and education is poor or problematic throughout South Asia, and political empowerment and participation is lacking throughout the region. The dysfunctional legal systems there also prevent citizens from accessing their rights. Prominent Hong Kong journalist and politician Emily Lau shares her message on International Women's Day regarding the situation and challenges facing women in Asia. Lau is the first woman to be the chairperson of Hong Kong's Democratic Party and in 1991 became the first woman to be directly elected to the Legislative Council. Here in Hong Kong, many people say that women have actually made great achievement. And I guess in terms of the rights we enjoy, maybe we are better off than the people in mainland China and in many parts of Asia. But still, women are, you know, trying very hard to crack the glass ceiling. If you look at the top echelon of the government, of the civil service and uh, of the business sector, it's still dominated by men. So we really have a lot more work to do because I always believe that women are just as smart as men. So in the decision-making circles, whether it is in politics or in business or in university or anywhere else, half of the decision-makers should be men and half women. But unfortunately, it's not the case. And even if we look around Asia, women still are not doing too well. And not too long ago, I traveled to Burma and I met Aung San Suu Kyi. And then, of course, we saw that her party uh, won the general election and there were many new members of parliament. We went as part of the UN development program uh, in taking part in an induction course for the new MPs. So there was full of hope and optimism. But now, People are very upset and angry because there are so many human rights violations in Burma. And Aung San Suu Kyi has turned a blind eye. And some people even say that uh, they should take away her Nobel Peace Prize. So I certainly hope the lady would come out with her courage and to speak for the downtrodden. And what we need in Asia and elsewhere are women who would, through elections, get their rightful place in political office or in big business, they take part in the running of the place. And I'm quite certain if women are given a fair chance because their way of dealing with problems, not necessarily smarter or better than men, but they have a different perception. So if you have women as well as men making decisions together, arguing, coming to a consensus, I think many of our problems could be better resolved. It's so sad that for so many, many years, women have been denied a place in top echelon. And now it's up to us, not just women, but the men as well, to help to ensure that we have equal opportunity. So here in Hong Kong, it's actually as I speak, I am someone who has not been allowed 
to travel to mainland China for more than 20 years. Why? Because of my political belief. I think that Beijing should tolerate dissenting views, should respect human rights. We in Hong Kong, we try very hard to ensure that we have human rights, we have independent judiciary, and to fight for a democratic system. And I think these are the wishes and aspirations of women and men throughout Asia and throughout the world. So in this very important day, I call on all our sisters and brothers to work much harder. We live in a terrible world, a world that is full of violence and bloodshed, suicide bombers, terrorist attacks. And Hong Kong, in a way we are lucky, is still one of the most peaceful and safest city. And it's like this because my people want it this way. But I'm sure people throughout Asia and the world would like to live in peace and to live in a safe place. So let us work together to try to get rid of discrimination, animosity, and to ensure that people can have a good share of the prosperity of the place. Then we will lessen hatred and lessen violence and bloodshed. In Indonesia, despite 17 years of political reform after Suharto, women are still frequently subjected to violence, discrimination, sexual harassment, and human trafficking. Indonesia also has more than 300 discriminatory laws and regulations that are used against women, such as aspects of Sharia law in Aceh province, the anti-pornography law, and various restrictions on women's mobility and clothing. Discriminatory regulations have been increasing in the past few years. The country's national and local parliaments are still dominated by men, resulting in many regulations and policies that lack an adequate gender perspective. Similarly, Indonesia's political parties have not provided enough opportunities and space for women to actively participate in the political arena. Concerned with these issues, women's rights defenders have worked hard to bring human rights and gender perspectives into the mainstream over the last 10 years. One of their achievements is the regulation that a minimum of 30% of parliamentarians should be women. Moving to Pakistan, the situation faced by women throughout the country is dire, as evidenced by its ranking of 143 in the Global Gender Gap Report. That's 143 out of 144 countries. Violence and discrimination against women is extreme, with a prevalence of honor killings. The recent killing of Hina Shah Nawaz, an educated young woman who was the sole breadwinner in her family for refusing to marry her male cousin, is indicative of the societal attitudes towards the roles of women. Only by enacting policies that address such entrenched and violent practices can Pakistan move towards upholding women's rights and ensuring social progress. The situation for women and other vulnerable factions of the society is quite dire as uh, so far in Pakistan since the beginning of 2017, more than 30 women have been a uh, victim of uh, um, honor killing, 23 of, of whom were uh, from a KPK province alone. So you see the situation um, in terms of uh, the vulnerability of women has not changed much uh, in terms of the violence. Uh, despite the fact there are a plethora of uh, laws uh, that have been enacted that have even criminalized honor killing, but we find that it so shows no sign of cessation anytime soon because of the patriarchal mindset. Uh, the thing that the state policymaker seems to have uh, not been able to grasp is that uh, mere policy making or mere amendment in the uh, regulation, rules, regulations, and laws will not change the mindset. What we need to work on uh, being uh, activists and being policy makers or uh, being uh, from the state uh, stakeholders is that we need to work on the patriarchal mindset, particularly of the male uh, members of the society, because it is through them that women tend to get most of the support from uh, in a culture like uh, ours. So uh, my message to all the women out there is to be bold and be strong for yourself and for your children. And uh, I wish all of you a very happy Women's Day. In Bangladesh, a new law allows girls to be married off before the age of 18 in special circumstances. The Child Marriage Restraint Bill 2017 was passed by Parliament on Monday and is being severely condemned by human rights groups. Human Rights Watch has called the law a devastating step backwards for the fight against child marriage. 
Bangladesh has the highest rate of child marriage in Asia, with 52% of girls married by 18. The new law does not define the special circumstances or best interests that would allow parents and guardians to get court approval to marry off girls under 18. Rights groups are concerned that the law could lead to rape victims or pregnant minors being married off to their abusers. In Kerala, India, a priest was arrested on February 27th for the rape of a 16-year-old girl. The girl became pregnant after she was raped and delivered the baby in January. The priest allegedly tried to cover up the incident. On March 5th, the Kerala police booked eight persons, including five nuns, for covering up the rape, and it was reported that all the accused will be charged under the POSCO Act, the Protection of Children from Sexual Offences Act 2012. The girls shared the incident with Childline, a helpline for children in distress, which tipped off officials, leading to the priest's arrest. In Indonesia, a Shia community from Sampang, Madura Island, East Java province, have been living in public flats since they were forcibly evicted and had their homes demolished by vigilante groups in 2012. They live without jobs, relying on a meager government allowance for their food and daily needs. Neither the East Java authorities nor the central government have shown a willingness to resolve the situation or to prosecute the vigilante groups and the negligent police officers. The Shia community's homes were burned in an attack on 26 August 2012. Some community members were killed and many suffered serious injuries. Earlier, Shia community leader Mr. Tajul Muluk was charged with blasphemy and imprisoned for two years. Instead of guaranteeing the Shia community's return to their homes, the government is forcing them to relocate without consultations. Just Asia speaks to Shia leader Tajul Muluk for details. Kondisi anak-anak ya sekarang ada yang sakit juga ada kena DBD kena kurangnya apa namanya uh, kurangnya kebersihan itu di, di sana karena memang tidak ada apa namanya. Ya, pemerintah hanya sebatas memberikan jatuh itu saja. Selain dari itu, enggak ada. So, Misalnya so. seperti masalah kesehatan itu tidak ada. Masalah kesehatan enggak ada. Pendidikan apa anak-anak juga banyak dibantu oleh oleh relawan. Walaupun sekarang ada sih memang sekolah darurat di sana. Sampai saya ini belum ada yang ngomong langsung ke saya gitu masalah penyelesaian seperti apa bentuknya yang mereka lakukan. Cuman sempat kemarin saya dengan Mas Joya pergi ke mana? Ke Swang. Jadi memang ada yang namanya sebagian itu yang punya itu mau direlokasi gitu di sekitar situ aja seperti itu cuman tidak ditempatkan di satu tempat seperti itu. Kan ya kami tetap harus pulang lah karena masalahnya bukan hanya masalah masalah apa namanya masalah tempat tapi ini masalah kan masalah demi mempertahankan konstitusi negara dan juga untuk apa namanya supaya ini tidak menjadi presiden buruk untuk daerah-daerah yang lain. Kami Finally, the Urgent Appeals Weekly features four cases, one from Pakistan, two from Indonesia, and one from Sri Lanka. In Pakistani Kashmir, journalist Muhammad Rafiq Kawaja was arrested and tortured in a private detention center. He is the first person in the state to be charged under the new anti-terrorism law. In Indonesia, local authorities in Depok City, West Java, forcibly sealed off an Ahmadiyya mosque. The government issued a controversial decision to permanently prohibit any Ahmadiyya activity in the mosque. Also in Indonesia, police officers and the Adidaya Tangu Company have been involved in land confiscation and violence against local community members in Taliabu Island in North Molucas province. Many community members were detained by the police and the authorities have been reluctant to investigate any alleged police abuse. In Sri Lanka, a group of police officers forcefully entered the home of Prasanka Fernando without any warrant. They verbally abused Prasanka and his wife and dragged Prasanka outside without explaining the charges against him. Although Prasanka has made written complaints about this, no investigation has been carried out. That is all for this episode of Just Asia. For more on these and other issues, please visit www.humanrights.asia or www.alrc.asia forward slash justasia. Thank you for watching and see you next week.